All right. Okay. So what tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, the absolute necessity and the gift of helplessness. I was talking to Smita about this just before because Diane Under made a big thing about helplessness. And you think, well, my goodness, you know, what's the story about helplessness? You know, like, because what happens is when we look at our, our oops, Daisy, I just better put my plug in. So when we look at when we look at ourselves as a psychophysical entity, we look at sort of two components. We're looking we're looking at the component of our thinking. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So we 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 engage in thinking, and we also we engage in activity actions, right? So what happens is, and in our functional life, that's extremely important to think and to act. Would you all agree with that? Yep. function because if I if I can't think I won't be able to remember how to go home do you know what I mean I, I I need to engage in thinking and I need to engage in actions in the functional order but we, what we're talking about here is we're not talking about functional skill functional skill is okay I mean you know you know, like, for example, human, human, human communication and human, you know, skills of communication. Well, sociopaths and politicians are extremely good at that. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? So, but what we're talking about here is we're talking about basically a change in our heart, a change in our heart and a change in our minds, right? Because if, if, if a change doesn't occur in our heart and minds, we don't change. But we have to understand this in a certain way. Now, when I really come to an understanding that I can do nothing about myself, that I can do nothing about myself, within that very understanding of my helplessness, that understanding will turn off my mental efforts to do something and my physical efforts to do something. Does that make sense? Wow. Okay. Without helplessness, we're buggered. But psychologically, we have a tremendous aversion to helplessness because we like to be in control. We like to feel we're going somewhere. Who, who's ever felt like, you know, that, you feel helpless and they feel an aversion and that and they then they start to tr try and desperately do something about their helplessness who's ever done that so normally normally we won't we won't even get near our helplessness we don't want to be anywhere near it and in fact as soon as we come to a perception of it we go ah and we start to do something we start to do something and that's a problem because what happens then is the machinery of ourselves as personality revs up. Okay, it revs up. Now, what's uh, necessary to understand is, is that the truth of the matter, and, we, and we've got to look at the truth of the matter, but the full acknowledgement of your helplessness, in other words, in the light of awareness, the, 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 in the light of you know how the presence of God is a light in our life that shows us what we're like? In the light of awareness, when that helplessness is fully revealed, helplessness is a revelation of God. It's grace. It's saying, it's, we, in our Western scriptures, we have that beautiful saying, I of my own self can do nothing, the Father within me doeth the work. You see, we have this notion that we've got to do something, which is great on the functional order. But when it comes to spirituality, how can... See, Swami Dayananda says that when we're looking at the light, life, and fullness that is God, which is termed in, in the Hindus talk about Satchitananda, don't they? So we paraphrase that in English. This life, light, and fullness that is God 
can never be appreciated as an object away from us. So it's not thinkable, and you can't get to it by any action. Oh, we're in trouble. Okay, we're in trouble. Now, but what, what, what am I involved in? You know, when I'm involved, whoever finds they get caught up and involved in the problem of, of, of living? Whoever, whoever feels that sometimes that they, their heart, their emotions, and, other, and their emotions, in other words, are, are completely caught up in being involved in the world. Involved in this obsessive, compulsive, relentless desire to try and find security and happiness where it's not. That's what mm -hmm. Swami Dayananda means by samsara. So here I am, my heart and my mind are completely involved in the world trying to deal with my fundamental disquiet or my fear or my or, or, or the or or deal with what I'm like. There's the problem centered on me, what I'm like. I hate being what I'm like. Now, once I had a tremendous involvement with alcohol, and the thing is that I loved alcohol. In other words, my heart, you know how Swami Dayananda says that we give our heart away to things? I gave my heart away to alcohol. So. It was caught up in alcohol. And my thinking served that appetite. Does that make sense? My thinking was a function of that appetite. So, of course, I never have any thought, well, this is a bit stupid what you're doing. No, 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 no. What I was doing was right. Oh, yes, I, I like alcohol. I'm, I'm just a social drinker. I just happen to drink a lot. But I'm socially. You know. So what happens is when we're when our heart is caught up in the world, our thinking becomes a function of that binding desire. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And we're full of binding desires. And because we're full of binding desires, we split life up into, into, into what we call good. And guess what good means? First of all, it's a good, uh, something other than God. It's, it is something, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're, it's not the recognition of what is truly good, which is the life, light, and fullness that is God. No, 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 no. There's an appearance and a, a type of experience. And we say that this experience, oh, this is good. Yeah, this is really good. So we, we actually genuinely believe there's an experience that is good. But so I like the experience of drinking because it allayed the fear and the self-dissatisfaction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And my also, my, all my thinking was just really... A function of that. If I was going to come home, come home, I think, okay, what I've got to do is I've got to go to the bottle store first. I have just a little quick whiskey so my wife doesn't know I'm drinking. And then I'll take take the beer home. This is when I was at 40. <laughs> but can you see how my heart and my mind was completely engaged in the world? And so when I, you, and I remember, you, I remember you, what, is it, was there any, I mean, your example is very clear. You're speaking from experience. Yep. So it's it's not your experience that that you could drink in a way to take an edge off and actually use it to just sort of relax. No, I'm, tra I'm talking about complete emotional dependence. Okay. However, there's 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 lighter forms of it, but basically, but don't know that we have an emotional dependence on the world. Right, and so, and so we have a craving for certain kinds of experiences, and because of that craving, and we're trying to we're trying to get as much successful experience. In other words, we're, we're trying to get as many experiences as we can that's going to satisfy the craving. We either hate things or hate all people who are blocking us from this, because if you're a craver, you're also a hater. It just goes with the territory. Consciously or unconsciously. You can say, oh, of course, I'm a loving person. Well, sorry. If you're caught up in dependence on the world, you have conscious or unconscious hatred that's working all of the time, believe me. Wow. Well, that's why they hated Freud. But anyway, but we won't go into that. Now, so... I got a, a, cute, a cute, quick thing to say. Yeah. I went to a, to a 
a house to drop off some goods for uh, animal shelters. Yeah. And the woman has, and uh, you know, she, she says she's a boarder. She has a sign out that says animals 2020 and something about, uh, I love dogs because all humans suck. Yeah. Right. So that, <laughs> so that woman, she's had some cravings an emotional dependence on certain type of experiences She's been disappointed, so she hates people, right? Okay. So because you can't help, if you're emotionally independent on the world for certain types of experiences, when you don't get those experiences, you're going to experience deep grievance. And, and yeah, Judy? Does it have to be a deep grievance or can it be a shutting down? Because... Oh no, it's just the same thing. It's, so, it's that's just a repressed grievance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 uh, Fr Dr. Freud's understanding of ego defenses. What happens is, what we do is we shut it down. We deny it, so it it it's just dull. It's not scaring the hell out of us. Well, to, see, for me, the experience has been that I usually want to fight something, right? Like that's yeah, yeah. been the, my identity, yeah. I fight. Yeah. For me to get to the point where enough, right? So I just give up. For me to do that, yeah, but well, but but we must distinguish. Going yeah, well, on well, here. we yeah, but but what? That's apathy. Apathy is not quietude or acceptance. Oh no, I'm not saying it isn't. But I'm no, 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 no. What I'm saying is. What what hap what happens is yeah, what happens is as as I'm struggling with things I might first of all go, get angry and then what happens is then I get fearful and then I get get sad and then I go what's the matter and, I, and what happens is I get, I I become dull because I've failed I become resigned resigned yeah or yeah, yeah exactly which but it, which is still which is still the same. It's, no, no, I understand that, but you're, you're getting to, at least for me, I'm getting to see a different side of me that I don't like any better than the other side. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're going to deal with that in a minute. Okay, so, so here we are. What happens is we find ourselves involved in the world. We find ourselves in the gutter. And our mind and our heart is, is directed and caught up in, inverted commas, the world. Okay? In the world that's external to us, in the world of appearances, this world of appearances that we try to find our home in. Good luck, by the way. Okay? Right? Because for Swami Dayananda, we're seeking happiness where it's not. We can't win the game. We can't. Okay? It's just, it's just the way it is. We cannot win this game of attempting to find security and happiness in the world of relationships, experiences with people, experiences with alcohol, experiences with sex, experiences with whatever. Okay, we all clear on that so far? Now, so what happens is the truth or the reality as we continue to bash our head against the wall trying to find happiness and good trying to sort our life out who's ever done this who's ever tried to sort their life out right now you can sort out your conduct because you can line it up with dharma which is quite good because it brings you into harmony with life or, or whatever right but still that's not that's that's the third striving the fourth striving is the striving for god the absolute Okay, the fourth striving. It's it's what Saint Saint Augustine said, My heart is restless until I rest in thee. Okay, it is the longing to find home, to be at peace, to be to find a resting place if you like. Now, but trying to find happiness in the world is to become involved. Your heart and mind are completely absorbed in the world when you're doing that. You, does that all make sense? The only reason you get unhappy is you haven't got what you wanted. It's a binding desire. All right, we're clear on that? I can't hear you, Bob. Can't hear you. Yeah, I just unmuted myself because yeah. I had spoken to Cecilia before. 
Um, I know in Vedanta, they, is it, there's a difference between binding desires and non-binding desires. Yeah, yeah. Dayananda puts so it quite not, simply. Dayananda says the, the, the bi binding desire is the emotional dependence that, that when I don't get it, I become disturbed and fearful and okay. upset. So whenever, have you ever experienced this week being upset or disturbed in any way, Bob? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. right. The basis of that's a binding desire. Because, okay. you're, because you're an ego-bound craving being often, and you've got certain cravings, when they're not satisfied, you, you're going to spit the dummy, as we say in Australia. Have you, have you heard that expression, spit the dummy? No. The dummy's a baby. He's got a, it's like a little teat in his mouth, and when the baby spits the dummy, it's, you know. Huh. Okay? Okay. The pacifier is gone. Pacifier is gone, yeah. Okay, so... So are we all clear that we can experience ourselves, our hearts and minds being involved? You know, Diane was talking about non-involvement about three weeks ago. We find ourselves, heart and mind, involved in the world. Who, and who, who even, for, even though we know about this teaching, who finds that it's very easy to become involved in the world with our hearts and minds? Who, who's ever found that? Hmm? Yeah. Say that okay. again. It's very easy to slip into being involved with the world. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I missed that part. I got the hearts and minds. Where, where our mind and hearts are involved in uh, seeking happiness where it's not. And there's okay. also seeking happiness where you think it's, yeah, in the spiritual world too, right? Well, the, well, if, if, if we think of it, if we think of it, if, if we... If we, if we don't understand the Vedantic vision that it's a journey without a distance, we'll be thinking of one day in the future I'm going to become enlightened, which is just another form of experience that I want. Right. Spiritual ambition, right? In contrast to the desire or the longing to be at home. Yeah, yeah, Andre? Uh, can I ask you, uh, like, mm, uh, the question is, where is... Uh, my um, uh, 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 better, I give an example. Oh, like yesterday, I, uh, it's um, kind of robbed uh, uh, with some ugly people, but it it, it was not. Um, it was let's say legal. It's, it's um, I uh, I'll sell. I I, will, I was selling some um, like stuff, and uh, I get. Uh, Finally, I got uh, like three times less than uh, it, uh, it was the price. So the question, uh, I can, uh, and uh, it was my fault, let's say. Yeah. Uh, can't hear, can't hear you, Andre. Ugly. Um, well, um, uh, maybe it's uh, better. That's better. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, so it was my fault. Uh, people was uh, ugly, uh, ugly, and uh, kind of gangsters. But uh, anyway, uh, it was um, it was my fault. So I can explain. I can. Uh, so I think that. Uh, my actions, uh, and I feel uh, I feel bad about uh, that about myself and how I act. Uh, so I can, uh, um, how to say, I can uh, think. Wow, uh, uh, it's just Ishvara. Uh, so um, let uh, feel this pain and uh, go forward. But. Um, no, Andre, we're going to answer that question. Can you hold off for a while? Okay. Okay. Now, so here we are. We're engaged. Okay, we're engaged. Our hearts and minds are in the gutter, and we're kind of caught and enclosed here, and we want to get out, and we feel stuck. Who's ever felt stuck and helpless hmm? about themselves? Who's ever felt that? Stuck, yeah, helpless, no. Okay. 
The fact of the matter is, you will eventually be brought to your helplessness. That's the most important thing. That what is going to happen is no matter what you try, no matter what you think about, no matter what you do, it's not going to work. Now, what I want to do is, you know, I like St. Thomas Aquinas. So we're going to uh, we're going to have a look at we're going to look at his definition of prayer. And what he calls it is, is rising, raising our hearts and mind to God, raising our hearts and mind to God. So here I am. I'm in, I'm engaged. I'm caught up. I'm caught up in the world. I'm caught up. I'm caught up with my heart and my mind. Does that make sense? Now, what's necessary? Wouldn't it be good to have a doorway in which to actually rise up out of this stuff? Mm. Does that make sense? Rise up out. Now, the secret to this is prayer. Being in a prayer, what Dianander calls a prayerful attitude. Okay? Now, the first thing, the first step with prayer is that the moment I really see how helpless I am, in other words, here I am, I'm caught up in a state of being. Who's ever been caught and closed in a state of being and they just hate it? Right? Normally what happens when that happens, we want to move away. So we get busy. We get busy. We start trying to do something. Who's ever tried to do something about themselves? Who's ever tried to think about themselves and see what, what's something wrong here? If I can only fix it, I've got it. I'm just not feeling right. I just I wish I could do something about it. who's ever who's got busy with themselves because of their their the the utter feeling of self dissatisfaction and the helplessness before that self dissatisfaction. Hmm? It's normal, isn't it? Okay, I'm an expert at this. Okay. Hmm. Now, now we come to the role of prayer. The role of prayer, the, begin, the basis of prayer, Swami Dayananda says with, with prayer, you can, it's, it's not a technique. It, it, no technique can replace prayer. Now, that's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? No technique can replace prayer. Hmm. Because, you see, prayer is an understanding. Okay, it's an understanding. First of all, that I can't possibly dig myself out of my mess because I'm the mess. The feeling of being a mess is centered on me. I am being a mess. Right? Now, what's good with, with the complete understanding of my helplessness? When I'm actually with my helplessness, I will have no I will make no effort mentally or physically in terms of action to do something. I'm brought to a full stop. I'm brought to myself as I am in a full stop. Are we clear on that so far? So here I am now because our understanding of God is this is that the light, life, and fullness that is God is continually embracing us and drawing us to itself, isn't it? Can't help it. Right? Now, the thing is that what's necessary is I need to be raised up. My heart and mind need to be raised up from the gutter up. That's a metaphor, by the way, a spatial metaphor. But it's quite a useful one, I find. Now, here's the trick. If I remain quietly and prayerfully with myself, now that may mean, because I'm in the mess, I, what I do is I recall a, the teaching. I consciously and deliberately bring the teaching to my mind that God is the material cause of the universe, that the very presence of the given is the presence of the giver. Or I pray in the sense of, I don't know what to do with myself, please help. Now, you're not talking, you're not talking to God with the understanding that he's like a big person up in the sky. When you 
Pray from the heart like that. Please help me. You are articulating your helplessness. Therefore, that turns off this obsessive, I've got to think my way out of this or I've got to do something to get out of it. Does that make sense? Because when the thinking and the doing is turned off, guess what happens to you as personality? Guess what happens? Personality is made, made passive. It's made passive. So here I am. So what happens is I don't raise my heart and mind to God. I'm actually lifted out by the very presence of God. I'm lifted out of myself. And it's a very interesting thing. When you remain with yourself prayerfully without any friction, if you remain with yourself as miserable, stuffed up person, right? You know how, who's ever heard of the spiritual idealism where you got to, you can't be critical and you mustn't be angry and you've got to be nice and you've got to feel this and that and, you, and you know, don't, don't evaluate things as right or wrong and just be accepted. Who's ever heard of this stuff? What happens if you're unaccepting? That's the fact. I'm unaccepting. So here I am, I'm, I am this, this unaccepting, pissed off person. I remain with myself as that. Does that make sense? Because when I remain with myself as that without resistance, I've now made that state of being available for the transforming action of grace. Does that make sense? Mm. Because I'm no longer fighting myself. Self-dissatisfaction. I hate being what I'm like. You see the dualism there? The dualism centered on me? But if I come to God completely as I am, so I recognize, you know, it's very good. good. You suddenly recognize you're upset. Recognizing that you're upset and that you're suffering, believe it or not, is grace. It's showing you your condition. Does that make sense? It's the light of God showing you what you're like. Now, once you understand that the doorway to rising above this condition is prayer, being in, being in a pr prayerful attitude, being in prayer, what happens is I remain with myself and I simply wait. I wait for the presence of God to act on me and lift me up. Does that make sense? It's all based on an understanding. That's why it's not a technique. It's an understanding that right here, right now, as I am, is precisely where I encounter the presence of God. Now, I may need to contemplate that fact. You know how Diananda says Nididyasanam is taking the, the words of the teaching and then without thinking, seeing the meaning? Okay? So I see the meaning that right here, right now, as I am, there's the presence of God is not away from any aspect of my experience. Now I can recall that deliberately and then seek to see that. Is that true? Hmm. Right. That prepares me. And then, so what I do is I, I, here I am, I'm in the mess, but then I'm going to, I'm, I'm consciously and deliberately, I'm, I'm disengaging my heart and mind from the world. I'm no longer going to struggle with the world to fix me. This is very important. Do you see how by that very fact that I'm becoming disengaged in terms of my mind and my heart, do you see how useful that is? Do you see how useful that is? And straight away, because I've actually withdrawn my attention from the world, I'm no longer looking at the bad shit and the good stuff. I'm not, I'm not looking at that at all. What happens is I find a sort of a, a release or a composure because I'm no longer – Struggling with it. Does that make sense? I may feel bad, but I'm not afraid of feeling bad because I want to bring the feeling of bad so that that feeling of bad myself in that condition can be raised up out of it and brought back into the lap of Ishvara. So basically, resting in the lap of Ishvara is an attitude, a way of being that comes out of my understanding of God. That's how Swami Dhananda puts it. It's an attitude. So it's, and it's an attitude that I can arrive at, 
But be, notice how it's born out of the action of the presence of God on me. It's not, I don't create it. I'm not going to say, I'm now going to relax. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to rest in God. No, no, none of that nonsense. I'm going to relax as I am. Stuffed up, judgmental, hostile bead. And I'm going to wait. I prayerfully wait. There's nothing quite like this prayer because you're, it's so honest. But it's not. But what happens is, see, Swami Dayananda says a very important thing, that, that for human beings we have a rupture of trust. We just don't trust. And you can't find trust in the world. Trusting people, like Alfred Lord Tennyson said, don't trust people with men with breath in their nostrils. Okay? Don't trust people. You can't trust people. So what do you do? Because, because human beings are in darkness, basically caught up with their cravings, their hates, and their fears, even though they cover it with a nice, innocent social face, it's so sweet. Hi, how are you? you know, all that. Because we know what we're like deep down, right? But the thing is that when we entrust, now trust, the word trust has two meanings. One is I believe it without evidence. Well, for us Westerners, we've had enough of that and we can't have that anymore, can we? All right? That's that's not that's not going to do anything for or forget it. We don't trust that way. But then there's the French meaning of the word trust, which means which means tr uh, uh, trust, which means I'm sorry, I mixed up. The word faith can mean either evidence, believing something without evidence right, which is a crazy notion, or it can mean trust. Now, when I come to God as I am, in my helplessness and in my despair, in my very painful emotional state, and I literally just simply place myself as I am in God's hands and I wait, do you see how that's trust? And that trust is brought about by a spiritual understanding. I, I can't trust. Trust arises in me. Trust is a gift. It's not an ego function. And so what happens is as I wait with myself, what happens is I find myself drawn into the lap of Ishvara. I become relaxed and I become at home with myself. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I'm in, I'm in a condition of trust. Does that make sense? Even though the world's still the same. What's happened? I've, I'm now no longer engaging in the world, so my heart and my mind have been released from that involvement. Does that make sense? Through an act of prayer. But even the prayer, the very fact that I notice I'm, in, I'm suffering and then I, at the very moment I actually have the wanting to turn to God, that comes, that comes from God. Does that make sense? That's the action of spiritual understanding act in me. It's not me being noble. Oh, I'm going to be nice and prayerful. Now. No, no, that's nonsense. Right? So the whole point with this is learning how to be prayerful. So our response to our pain, our, as soon as you, we notice that we're upset, we're no longer composed, we're fighting, we're resisting. Who's familiar with emotions like that? Anybody aware of that? What we do is we approach it prayerfully. In other words, we approach it with our understanding of God. And, and when we understand that, okay, there's nothing I can do about my way I'm being. The only thing that transforms me is the presence of God appreciated. But while I'm absor absorbed in the world and active and busy, 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 can I hear the voice of God? Of course I can't. Do you see what I mean? In our, in our Western scriptures, we, there's a saying, I think it's in Psalms or it might be Samuel or something, but it says, it says um, speak, Lord, thy servant, hear us. Speak, Lord, thy servant, hear us. Right? In other words, what happens is when we, when we stay with our helplessness prayerfully, we wait and we're attentive to what is going to come through. Does that make sense? And we just wait. And then what happens is we find ourselves starting to be more, but just being more composed. 
But we're not trying to be composed. Our job is to arrive. But faith, trust, we just, we trust, we entrust ourselves as we are. And, and, and because, we, because of the spiritual understanding of our helplessness, if we really understand that there's nothing we can do about ourselves, we can do something about our conduct, like Dharma, that's fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spiritual transformation. We cannot transform ourselves spiritually. Right? So basically, we cannot... What, when the presence of God becomes evident in our consciousness, that is what transforms us. The abiding in the appreciation of the presence of God. And so what, what happens is it's very good to spend time in prayer. So long as we understand what we mean by prayer. When we're in prayer, we're disengaging ourselves from this relentless, compulsive pursuit of trying to find happiness where it's not, which Dayananda called samsara. And we raise in, and in, in the act of prayer itself, we find our hearts and minds are raised up to God. Does that make sense? So we arrive at Ishvara's lap. Okay. So just before we go on, Bob, what's, uh, what's so far what I've been talking about, what's, what's become clearer? Oh, what's become a little clearer is what, what, what the vision of helplessness or the importance of helplessness is and the fact that you're not, you know, it has, it has such a prominent role to play by not confusing the fact that in the practical life, uh, there's a function of not being of not feeling helpless, but feeling powerful. But in the spiritual life, that's that's not you know, uh, or that's not the case. That, no, um, the importance of humility, I guess, is another way. It of is. Saying. Yeah. When you when you when you appreciate the fact that you're actually helpless, it turns off the machinery of thinking and doing towards an end. Mm, spiritually okay. and yeah. then you're then you're quiet and receptive and then something else can take place it's mm -hmm. actually god calling you to himself you know how they talk about how, you know, how he brings you to your knees mm. you heard that expression well i think i have yeah yeah it's it just it's basically we can do things in functional life, but functional life is limited. And we're going to find that when people die. There's, there's so many things that are just beyond, we're completely helpless before. And so and so either we do the duty track, which is go down and become apathetic, which a lot of people do and become dull, or this understanding of God opens up something because the very fact of helplessness is the action of grace operating in our life. It's a realization. It's a magnificent realization. And we know when we've realized it because we'll become quiet and inactive in relation to our suffering. We'll just be remaining. Wow. Okay, good. Yeah. Kevin. Um, it's very interesting just um, when you said that you know, my thinking will conform to, you know, where my heart is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the, it's the, it's the, it was it the, was the, the Yanks got an expression. What do they call it? The wagging the, the tail wagging the dog. Yes. And yeah. um, so that's informative as well when you notice yourself thinking and know that you're where your, where your heart is with regardless. Yeah. Um, because if, it's, if if the thinking is upset, well, you you I will be. It's this illustrator that I'm craving for where happiness uh, happiness is not, and I, I'll be cut off from God basically. 
Yes, our, our, our heart is only happy when it's resting in God. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very good, Kira. Judy. I'm just doing a lot of listening today. I'm just, I don't know, you know. Okay, that's fine. Michelle. Well, so that state of just being in the lap of God yep. and being involved with life and all that comes with it, I see it as being sort of a dance when you go in and out all yes. the time. And um, to want to be in one state more than the other is fruitless because you we actually go from one state to the other. So... Um, yeah, I'm okay. Well, with well, that. well, no, well, no, but the, the actual desire to be in Ishvara's lap is, is a very good desire. Yeah, and also life grabs us back and off yeah. we go again. Well, not so much life grabs us back, it's centered on us. We love, because we are seeking our happiness in certain experiences, we're constantly being disappointed. Yeah. Because it is binding desires. I want. Yeah. That's the basis we, of our... Yeah. yeah, but I don't really see that we could be without that because it's sort of a human nature. It's well, human. well, we need desires in the sense of to look after ourselves in terms of security and all of this sort of stuff, but binding desires we can neutralize. And what Swami Dayananda says, when the... You see, with binding desires, we find the world incredibly attractive. We miserize it because we f we love the world. Yeah. While that love is there, it, it has us, right? But the more we love God, inverted commas, does that make sense? The more the binding desires are neutralized, the more contemplative we can become. Okay. And the only reason that the binding desires are so strong is behind every binding desire is intense fear and self-dissatisfaction. What we're doing in karma yoga, when we, when we come to God exactly as we are, we're giving a chance to that fear and that self-dissatisfaction to be resolved into Ishvara, which neutralizes the power of the binding desire. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I can understand it. Um, um, at one level, and at the other level is um, <laughs> I, I don't. I have. Um, I, I understand it, and but the experience of it is different. So I have to. I guess I just have to sit with it. Yeah. Well, basically, we basically the simple action of just simply remaining with ourselves as we are and as we are placing ourselves in God's hands and sort of just simply leaving it up to him to deal with. That's a very important thing. Yeah. Because otherwise we just get caught up in self-struggle and self-struggle yeah. is just more of self. That's the problem there. So when you were talking about trust and faith, um, I guess it's because of the meaning that I, you know, previously have given those words that I am feeling conflicted. I think that's what. It uh, is. Okay, when you when you're just simply at home in yourself, resting in the lap of Ishvara, there's a feeling of trust that has no reason. It just simply arises. Mm -hmm. yeah. You haven't produced it. Right. That's that's real faith. Okay. Right? Because it's not it's not it's not belief without evidence. Nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. But it but it it arises. It, it is born out of an understanding of what God is. What Swami Dayananda says that. He said, faith is suspension of judgment pending discovery. <laughs> so if you, so here you are, you're with yourself, you don't know what to do, and you just simply suspend judgment and you're just left with yourself. That's a very honest thing. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful starting point because 
You can only when you arrive, only when you're just being what you're really like without resistance, is there a chance for that to resolve into Ishvara because that, because then the presence of reality is shining its light on you and you're being just like you are, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So then why would I have so much resistance into letting go into this? Because we have a very strong sense of wanting to preserve our separate identity apart from God. Mm -hmm. Because it means the end of ourselves is personality. And believe it or not, we're afraid of that. That's why we keep it busy because it's like a hologram. We've got to give it a bit of energy because if it starts to get a bit thin, we just go, hmm. Not like that. So, okay. Yeah, like what, what you say, it's back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is every day I fall away, Michelle. Every day I notice myself getting involved. And the moment I do, I just simply shift into being prayerful. And then I fall away and then I shift into being prayerful. Sometimes I'll just sit with myself quietly. Do you know what I mean? Just prayerfully. I'll just sit there. Do you know what I mean? Because I, it, it's good to do besides just the, you know, the, this remaining the same. You know, you know how karma yoga is remaining the same? When you're yeah, being yeah. prayerful, you're remaining the same. In other words, you're not fighting. You're not, you're not going up and down. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not going to ego inflation, ego deflation, ego inflation, ego deflation. You're remaining quiet in the face of your experience or you're remaining still in the face of your experience. Or you're remaining the same in the face of your experience. Okay, good. Meet up. Um, when we pray, we do it out of choice. So by praying, we are acknowledging our helplessness. And yep. that's how we, we connect with Ishvara, like we establish a relationship. Yep. And that in that helplessness, uh, we sense the presence of the given. That's precisely and, uh, where we. That's precisely where we meet the presence of God. Yeah, so that fills you up, and then you know it. Uh, then the prayers just take over, and you, uh, you know, you just let it happen. You know, just uh, you, you let God draw himself, draw you back yeah. into His lap. Yeah, yeah. Very good, Smita. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Last week and especially uh, uh, yesterday evening, I have a lot of um, feeling helplessness. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so and um, uh, emotional pain um, um, with that. Now I uh, was um, uh, staying with the pain and uh, um, like back and forth, uh, staying with the pains and um, unconsciously trying to. Um, rewrite uh, the past uh, uh, events. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, uh, stay in pain, then uh, rewrite, then no, oh, okay, back and forth. Um, but uh, the very uh, great thing uh, today I, I've heard is uh, that uh, this uh, Pain and helplessness is uh, really, it's, it's a grace and uh, yes. God ca calling me uh, because, yeah. you know, it, it was uh, like very, very uh, timely and uh, very great um, to listen to these words. To, prayer, to, to prayer, this word. Yes, prayer has a very bad, it's got bad press in the West, you know what I mean, because it's, but it's actually indispensable. Because prayer is a disengagement of your mind and heart in the world so that something else can become evident. A different life can become evident in you. And that's very, very important. You're very good, uh, Andre. Cecilia. Yes. What stands out to you today? Surrender. Yeah. That's what I mean. Surrender. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. You can, I can, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I, I completely understand the fact that um, I was having very horrible thoughts about 
losing my kids and I was in the middle of this dramatic thing in my head and then without before today I said I just gonna surrender I just there is nothing I can do really and I did pray but you know I was praying <laughs> so I remember last week when you told you told me you you were saying about um being with your being and that's what I did and that kind of did the trick I used start being in anything else but being with me and I always think now oh I'm being I'm made of God and that's always comes back to that that I regardless of what I do I don't do good things or bad things or whatever I'm still in God and that's you're, all, you're always you're always embraced by God yeah you're always embraced by this benevolent presence which doesn't change its nature, no matter how stupid you act. Yes, exactly. And without knowing, I, I, I came back to the praying that you mentioned today, being, being, just being with God in that yes. communion, just resting, that's it. Very good. And, and, and notice how we don't surrender as our helplessness is revealed, we are surrendered. Uh, because otherwise we, we can start to ascribe things to ourselves. We don't under senior principle is everything is given. He says, you don't even have to practice. You don't have to learn to be humble. He says, if you genuinely understand that everything is given, you'll be humble. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, same, so the same thing happens. All right, so that's very good. So what we're going to do is we're going to just try something now. What I want you to do, I want you to understand that when we, when we are, what we want to do is we want to ab abide in prayer. Do you know what I mean? So we want to shift into being prayerful, which is an attitude. Being prayerful. And so we're not going to pray for anything as such because we're not going we're not, to, we're not going to pray for what we crave for in the world because we're never going to get anything we want in the world. And, 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 but what, what, we need to, we, what we need to pray for is wisdom and understanding. No. Does that make sense? But wisdom and understanding is given. So when the wisdom that comes from God becomes active in us, we find ourselves understanding. But it's given. It's not me understanding or me being wise. Right? So what we're going to do, we're going to understand what Swami Dayananda meant, that, that no technique can replace prayer. The very important point he made. So I'm just going to sort of guide you into it, right? We, but, but just first of all, just come back quietly. Just quietly come back with the understanding that we're going to disengage our attention in the sense that we're no longer going to struggle with our situation, we're going to let. We're just going to let our thinking get turned off, and our and our uh, our, our trying, the trying to get turned off, with the understanding that all I have to do is I just have to remain with myself helplessly as I am. What I'm like is what I'm like. I'm just like I'm like, and I'm not going to fight that. I'm going to leave what I'm like. And let what I'm like be embraced by the ever-present embrace of God. And I'm just going to quietly wait here. I'm not going to try and silence my mind or, or, or be quiet or, or gain stillness. I'm just going to find, let myself rest. And by the way, the stillness will come by itself. We don't have to worry about that. So I'm simply being prayerful. Understanding that there's nothing I can do or nothing I can think that can fix me up.
It's only in the appreciation of the presence of being or the presence of God that I find myself being at home with myself. I find myself simply living the understanding of what prayer is. I'm letting myself be carried back home. My heart and mind are being drawn up into God. Okay, I just want to just say something here. When you do this, you may not you might not arrive back at that point, in the, but in the sense of it, remaining with yourself as you are, entrusting yourself as you are, is the same all the way from the pro, even if the terrain changes. So the experience might still be like this. That's fine, um, because it's not it's not important. And then you just keep coming back to it. And the thing is, what will happen is you you acclimatize yourself to the fact that you let yourself be carried and if because you are actually because your recognition of helplessness has turned off the machinery of the thinking and the machinery of the trying to do stuff you find yourself who noticed that they were being quiet being quiet do you notice that but you were not trying to make your mind still and all that nonsense were you okay very good Okay, Bob, tell us what did you what did you what did you notice? Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> I noticed that there was there's always this reservoir of just trusting trusting that the the words that you're speaking will have the necessary effect. Right. Well, what, 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 I mean that that almost sounds a little. Uh, I know what you mean. The, the what the the content of the words, the meaning of the words. When you bring your attention to seeing the meaning that the words are expressing, that has an effect, doesn't it? Yes, that's the evidence. That's the evidence. That, yeah, that's the existential evidence of vision. Yes. Yeah. Okay. When you, yeah. when you are abiding in the vision that Dayananda unfolded, you become different. That's just a fact. Very good. Kevin. Um, I, I just find it incredibly helpful, um, the guidance of uh, just not doing it for a thinking process, just being aware of what I'm like whether it's yeah. a form of thoughts or whatever. And so I don't try and think it shouldn't be like that or it should be like this or anything. Any, I don't try and mediate the, the practice of yes. through, through, through thoughts or thinking. And uh, I naturally find myself being quiet. That's right. You know, and I'm not in the, I'm not, there's without the, the looker, if you like, or the, the doer of quiet, 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 quiet. And, and you begin you begin to understand that the light, light and fullness starts to manifest as you, mm. as your life, mm. not away from you. You just you find yourself you are finding yourself being composed. In other words, you're given a new life, aren't you? It's so much different yeah. than the, the the life of involvement in the world. Very good. Judy. Yeah, um, when we were doing this, my son needed to ask me something. We were, and it just arose. And because I was in that place, 
it wasn't it was an interruption it wasn't it had to be this way go away it was very good i just and then i was back yeah it, it, it just flowed. Yeah. there's no and that's where um you don't try to mediate you don't try to control it no no but by residing there yeah the absolute place of being there as you say changes yeah. you you don't you don't and things happen it's not like all of a sudden you just become this nothing no 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 no, no, no. Still, you're still manifesting but without an agenda i guess well you mo you move by kindness was what i noticed um, I, I guess, yeah, because it, kindness in that I didn't make him bad and wrong for it. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Story about bad and wrong. You know, yeah, yeah. I just, but, but you weren't, wait, but you weren't trying like kindness to me. It just seemed like yes. natural action. Yes. Natural but you weren't, but you, yeah, you weren't being self-consciously kindness, but you were being, you were just simply being kind. So it wasn't something you were doing. Right. It was just very good. Program. Very good. But bear in mind within the life of Dharma, when you feel like getting angry or cross with your husband, we have to kind of use our will because it's very appropriate in terms of restraining ourselves from harmful actions. But when we're talking about when we're talking about prayer, Dayananda says it's a complete letting go of will and thinking. Okay. Now with husbands, okay. Yep. All right. Good thing. Um, so when one finds oneself being unkind, it's a clear sign yeah. that, that you're not in that prayerful. You're, thing, you've you've right? fallen. You've you've you've, fought, you've. What happens is we're normally under the sway of our egoism. Agreed. Right. It's much better. It's much better to be under the sway of the life, light, and fullness that is God, because then that starts to govern you instead of your psychology. Right. So, so what I find, just a real quick question, it just, things are going and they're fine for whatever length of time, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. But it's almost like the yeah. psychology yeah. rears its head and even though a situation is has been not an issue, even though it may be dysfunctional, it's yeah. not been an issue, okay? Yep. Then all of a sudden you find yourself making an issue of it, and then the dysfunction instead of functioning yep. becomes dysfunctional. Like, like well, it's well, almost like it's, it's like a, a well, do, well. First of all, when I said to Dianunda, you don't see pathology, do you? He says, no. There's only order. If you're under the egos, the sway of the ego, you're going to act stupidly and badly. If you're under the sway of God, you'll act differently. That's a law. And Swami Dayananda says, we're learning to live a life of karma yoga. And he says, he explains like dolls, you know, those Chinese dolls. He said, you know, you, something happens and you go wobble. And he says, what you do is wobble back. He says, he says, karma yoga is wobbling back. So we're not afraid of, we're, 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 we want to see ourselves falling away so we can wobble back. Fall away, wobble back. Fall away, wobble back. And in that process, we're wobbled back. Because there's there's nothing to fix, though. This is what I see, is that uh, the only reason there's uh, there, what occurs, because this might help me, yeah. is that the only reason it occurs that there's something to fix is that the ego's involved. Yes. Because everything is just occurring. However, and, however, we mustn't avoid the new age thing and understand that we must correct our conduct, but oh, we can. Well, I, but, I, I got but, that down there. There's but, functional but, living. But, but, we, words, but we can't correct ourselves. Okay. Correct our, correct our conduct, but not our state, not our what we're like. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Michelle. All right. So what I've noticed is that I, I react to the vocabulary or the, the words that are being used. Because in my experience, um, I don't give it to God. I I tune into it. So it's just a different yep. action in, in my head. Yep. So if I adjust the vocabulary, I think I feel a lot better. Um, and so um, and then also my understanding of, you know, we go in and out of this state, 
and this is totally normal. It's really, you know, we could be all the time in one or the other, but honestly, we just move from one to the other constantly and like, you know, wobbling back um, to the preferred um, position in a way. Um, yeah, to so abiding, ab abiding and the whole point is learning how to be at home with ourselves in the face of all these changing experiences. That's the fundamental oh, like practice. That. That's the like fundamental that. practice. Now, that once we understand that, you see, when I say I turn to God and I place myself in his hands exactly as I am, I'm speaking metaphorically. I don't believe he's yes. got hands, right? <laughs> so, but it's, but it's a meta metaphor that conveys a meaning and, and it's something, it's a meaning I can live because I just turn up as I am. Yeah. You see what yeah. I mean? So, and that turning up as you are, and you not trying to fix yourself mm -hmm. is faith, is trust. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. the metaphor, the way that you actually are presenting it, um, to me, means something that I don't want to have. I don't want to be there. That's why um, I have to be careful with this because it's not that I, I don't really want to be in the lap of God. It's yeah. that... I, you know, I want to feel this uh, omnipresence. That's most, that's really how I experience it. Yes. And, and when you, when you are empty of personality, the presence is very evident. But when can I be absent of personality? I think it's always there. We just don't, you know. No, 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 no. There's two modes. There's two modes of being in the world. There's you as simple conscious person and you as personality. That's always the case, right here, right now, as you are, one or the other. There's not. There's no halfway mark. You're either con no, no. You're either conscious. There might be a depth of being conscious, but you're either a simple conscious person, or you're caught up in your reactions, which is personality. But isn't it, but isn't it like we just move? you know, from one to the other. So, you know, sometimes there is more or less. And, you know, well, no, 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 well, not quite, actually. It's more that fact that I'm either rooted in, in the presence of reality, which means I'm conscious, I'm alive to facts, or I'm lost in reactions. When I come to my helplessness, hmm. I will find the reactions will turn off. I still might be miserable, but I'm aware that I'm miserable. That's not the point. Or would it be that the personality is uh, is calmed down? Um, the the well, personality is, well, is not. No, not quite. Active. Not quite. It, because what happens is there's a shift of gravity in the sense that you discover yourself when you're filled with the presence of reality. You find yourself being a simple conscious presence. When you're rooted in personality, there's always self objectification. I'm this. I'm that. I wish I wasn't like that. I do this or that. And and the whole point the whole point is, when personality becomes passive, I become evident as a simple conscious person. Okay, good. So being passive doesn't mean it disappears; it's still there, but it's passive. Yeah, well, 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 that, well it's it, it hasn't been resolved totally. Otherwise, it would never recur again, which it does. Okay, all right. So now I, I understand what you mean because we actually mean the same thing. Okay, we're good. <laughs> okay, good, okay. Yeah. Uh, I just surrender to God in the, the way I am and that uh, filled me with trust and that uh, gave me the sense of security and uh, I was totally at peace with myself to be, I mean, like uh, for God to be accepting me as I am. So that gave me a sense of security and uh, uh, it just filled me up with uh, gratitude, you can say, or yeah, yeah. I was just at home with myself in spite of my shortcomings or helplessness. So I was- uh, Yeah, what, what, happen good. what happens is you, you when you're just simply being at home with yourself in Ishvara, the functional limitations of your life are not disturbing you because you're not judging yourself about them. That's and that's very good. And and the, what happens is the 
the culmination of prayer, which is the I, inverted commas I, when I say ideal state, when I am composed, when I am composed in Latin, composed means a composition is together. When there's no friction in me and I'm just composed, right? So as soon as I'm no longer fighting, there's a sense of composure becomes evident. Also freedom because I'm not being determined by the presence or absence of what's happening. I'm not being determined by the good or the so-called bad. That's no longer oper That's no longer determining me. So I have a, I'm experiencing psychological freedom. And also because I'm at home with myself, there's no self-dissatisfaction. I hate being what I'm like. And this is what Swami Dayananda calls resting in the lap of Ishvara. This is our measure. So we can then see when we fall away from it, can't we? And when we see we've fallen away from it, that is actually being, being it's like God coming and saying, come back home. The very seeing of falling away. So the meaning of our suffering is that we've fallen away from the lap. Not that I'm bad or horrible, I've got problems or any of that stuff. Very good. Very good, Smita. Celia. Cecilia. Can't hear you, Cecilia. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, okay, I think you'll be... Go ahead. Okay. Okay, Cecilia, you, what did you notice? What did you notice? Um, the peacefulness of being being. I don't have to do anything else. No. Stay. That's all. That's all I I see. Yes. Yeah. There's a there's a metaphor in the Shin Buddhist tradition where they talk about people's relationship with some people see the relationship with God kind of like, like a monkey grabbing around his mother's neck and desperately holding on. But then there's a kitten and what the kitten does, it doesn't hold on. It just goes limp and the cat carries it. The mother carries it. So that they see the relationship with God like that. So we just, we go limp as a cat and we let ourselves be carried. It's quite a beautiful, uh, I have, yeah, I have six cats, so I know how it's done. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. And I, I, I learn a lot from them. Oh, good. Okay, very good. So, I, I, when I'm kind of in doubt about how to do it, I remind them. I remember somebody said that he lived with a lot of Zen masters. He was referring to his, to his cats. And I get the point because... You observe a cat and they are just happy the way they are. Yeah, yeah. Any, any, any weather, any house, any condition, they are just that. And I think they are, I, I learned a lot from them. Yeah, and the wonderful thing about Dayananda was that you can't, unless you're at home in reality, you can't be at home with yourself. Unless you're filled with the presence of reality, you cannot be at home with yourself. Not possible. Because you're cut off, you see. Very good. Andre. Uh, I noticed uh, um, that uh, my uh, feeling of uneasiness uh, goes down and uh, some profound, uh, not disappeared, but uh, uh, melting. Uh, yes. And some profound... Uh, mm, deep satisfaction rises. And so you see what Dayananda means that you, there's no, no technique that can replace prayer. You are not, you are just simply living an understanding of what prayer is. Does that make sense? So you are not, you weren't petitioning, gimme, gimme, gimme. Right? You, you were just simply, you have found yourself just simply being in an existential condition of entrusting as you were. All right. So I suggest, you know, this coming week, 
whenever you notice yourself in pain or in suffering, just suddenly pause and go, okay, I'm just going to disengage from my, my what the way I usually am, and I'm just going to sit quietly as I am, and I'm going to let myself be transformed by the action of God's presence in my life. Okay? All right? All right. Okay. All right, well, very nice seeing all you guys again. Yes. Thank you, Pete. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Okay, Good and night. Bob, can you hang around for a minute? Okay. I'm okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.